thank you everybody uh, for joining us on this uh, Veterans Day and uh, this uh, beautiful November day in Pittsburgh. Um, we're so excited to have you here with our latest Lunch and Learn. Um, I'm Karen Lightman. I'm executive director of Metro 21 Smart Cities Institute here at Carnegie Mellon University. We are university-wide. We um, work with faculty and uh, researchers and students uh, throughout the university, all seven colleges and the libraries. We've got lots of um, projects that we work our, our, um, through it, throughout the municipality. Our goal is to take the research and development here at Carnegie Mellon and deploy it in real world projects in collaboration with our community and municipal partners. We're doing this throughout Southwestern Pennsylvania. You can go to our website for a great list of the projects that we're working on and um, make sure that you subscribe to our newsletter so you can get updates on the work that we're doing. Um, this opportunity, this Metro 21 Lunch and Learn is really an opportunity to collaborate and connect with fellow faculty and students, as well as the broader community so that we can have a conversation about the work of Metro 21 and our faculty and highlight opportunities for involvement and foster future interdisciplinary collaboration. I think you all know this is being recorded and as you enter, your microphones will be muted. Um, we will have moderated Q&A where we'll get you unmuted so you can ask your question or please use the chat to pose any questions. Um, let's see, today's speaker, I'm really thrilled to have Hai Zhu with us. She is the Daniel P. Swarick Assistant Professor of Human Computer Interaction here at Carnegie Mellon. Also, Dan is a, a longtime friend of mine, so I think it's fantastic that you have his, um, his name attached to you, Hai. He's a fantastic guy. Um, so Hai received a BS in computer science from Tsinghua University and a Master's of Science and a PhD in HCI here at Carnegie Mellon. Um, she's received multiple NSF awards. They too many to uh, list here, but they include an eager on AI and society, um, which is pretty awesome, and a project with Smart and Connected Communities, which is one that I'm working with her on. Um, she's also won several paper awards um, in many areas and also the Alan Newell Award for Research Excellence. Um, we're working with Hai on her current National Science Foundation project called Empowering and Enhancing Workers Through Building a Community-Centered Gig Economy. So um, we're really thrilled to Hai have Hai with us. So please join me in welcoming her while she gives her presentation on From Discovery to Design, Creating AI Technologies to Support Massive Scale Online Collaboration. Hai, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much. Hi, thank you, Karen, for the introduction. So let me share my slides. Can people see my slides? Okay, great. Hi everyone, my name is Haidro. I am an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, it's my great pleasure to speak here today. And today I'm going to talk about from discovery to design, creating AI technologies to support massive scale online collaboration. Online platforms such as peer production platforms, social media, social networking sites, and gig economy platforms have revolutionized the world by creating virtual spaces where people can interact with each other around the shared purpose. For example, millions of people have written articles on Wikipedia, making it the largest encyclopedia in history. Over 2 billion people use Facebook and 300 million people use Twitter to maintain relationships and share information. Gig economy platform facilitates short-term contract work performed by independent workers who are paid in return for the gigs they perform. And Uber hit 5 billion total trips in 2017. Freelancer site like Upwork has over 18 million registered freelancers and 5 million registered clients. So these online platforms are becoming natural extension of our social experiences, uh, affecting how we connect, communicate, exchange, and work with each other. These platforms profoundly affect the way our groups, communities, organizations, networks, and the market work. In the meantime, humans are also shaping these online platforms. 
platforms and human lives groups, organizations, and societies are co-evolving, transforming each other in the process. And uh, in my own research, I conduct two types of research act activities to study these online platforms, discovery type and the design type. So for the discovery type of work, I'm trying to study these platforms to generate new understandings of the massive scale collaboration and the coordination that take place on these platforms. And uh, in the design type of research, I try to create novel AI technologies or improve existing AI technologies to better support these online platforms. So in uh, my talk today will be organized in this way. I will first provide a quick overview of my discovery type of research and the discussion of my research trajectory, the transition of focus from discovery to design. And then I will talk about one specific study on designing AI technologies, an AI tool to support recruitment in massive scale online production. And next, I will talk about some of our ongoing work on designing AI-based management systems on different online platforms, including the Smart and Connected project that uh, we are currently working with Karen. And finally, I will talk about the big picture. So I will start with my discovery work. So since 2011, I have been publishing papers on understanding the activities people engage on peer production, social networking, and the gig economy platforms. For example, I study peer uh, production sites like open source software, Q&A sites, citizen science projects, enterprise online communities, and Wikipedia. I also study social media sites like Facebook, Weibo, and Douban. I'm also interested in like gig economy sites like um, uh, Uber, Lyft, TaskRabbit, Upwork, and Airbnb. Here is just a selected list of representative work. And in my research, I combine social science theories, machine learning, and log data analysis to understand people's social activities on these sites. As you might have noticed, I spend a lot of time studying Wikipedia. I will just briefly talk about three studies in the context of Wikipedia to illustrate my approach. So well, Wikipedia to me is more than just the largest encyclopedia in the world. What interests me most is that Wikipedia is also the largest collaborative project in human history. And one theme I have been exploring about Wikipedia is how Wikipedia manages to organize millions of contributors from all over the world with different backgrounds, commitments, interests, and experience to achieve a common goal, which is writing these encyclopedia articles. Note that many techniques used in conventional organizations, such as formal employment contracts and monetary incentives, are not available in peer production sites like Wikipedia. In the absence of these elements, managing contributors in, on Wikipedia is like herding cats. It really becomes challenging for Wikipedia to direct the members to accomplish tasks that are really important for the community as a whole. In the paper published in 2012, uh, I studied how the nested organizational structures called the Wiki Project support the collaboration and organizations in Wikipedia. Just like America has 50 states, and Wikipedia has actually has hundreds of Wiki projects that help govern the activities of millions of volunteer workers. So in this paper, we talk about the functions of this group in online production. And then my student Bowen Shane and I together with, with our collaborator Chen Chen Ren and Laurent Ving, we started uh, the histories of uh, archived uh, of, like uh, log of this one thousand wiki project over fourteen years, and found that these wiki projects are in general subject to high turnover, which is not surprising since the particip uh, participation in these projects is voluntary. But we also found that on average, controlling for the agent size of the project, the positive effects of one newcomer joining were larger than the negative effects of one old timer leaving. So the implication is that the online production groups will survive or you will become more successful as long as there are new people to replace the people who leave. We, but we also found that unfortunately, a lot of these projects experience decline due to the shortage of supply of newcomers. 
And then we, uh, we have this question, can we help these wiki projects identify suitable newcomers? Uh, my student Bowen and our collaborators and we uh, further study over 79,000 project members to explore which types of newcomers would survive. And the idea is the pre-joining connections to predict these people's post-joining productivity and the retention. We draw two types of pre-joining connections and uh, we identify two types of pre-joining connections that interest much, which is like how much these newcomers interests were aligned with the group's interest and the personal connections, which is to what extent the newcomers have personal connections with the existing members of the groups. And our analysis shows that both types of connections can really increase the post-joining productivity and reduce the likelihood of withdrawal. So the takeaway is that, is that we know wiki projects, which are subgroups within Wikipedia, are really important. We know wiki projects really need newcomers. We also know who will thrive in the projects. However, even though we can help these project organizers uh, like, like identify who are the suitable members, and this is still a non-trivial job given the scale of the Wikipedia. So in Wikipedia, as of July 2017, this is still a little bit outdated, but, uh, but now the data is, the number is even larger. So the English Wikipedia alone has about 500 active wiki project, uh, active wiki project covering about 3.6 million articles. And there are about 2.9 million editors uh, with more than 10 edits. And there are about 38,000 new editors registering the site on a monthly basis. So therefore we ask the question, can we design an intelligence recruitment system that can automatically help wiki projects to identify and recruit a suitable new member? So this also shows a transition from like discovery to design. Uh, I'm not only interested in like understanding the activities on these platforms, and moreover, I'm also interested in uh, uh, like integrating these findings to develop novel technologies and tools to enhance the effectiveness of collaboration and coordination on these platforms. So uh, next I'm going to present one project to demonstrate our effort to create AI to support these uh, activities on Wikipedia. So specifically, I will talk about how we design a value sensitive intelligent recruitment system for Wiki projects on Wikipedia. So using AI or algorithm to evaluate people and assist the recruitment decision is it is in general very difficult because there is no clear ground truth. And it is particularly challenging to build intelligent recruitment system in the context of Wikipedia due to the community acceptance to AI technologies. In Wikipedia's 10 years of history of building and using AI technologies, we have seen that some sophisticated AI tools failed because they were insensitive to contributors' motivations. And sorry. <laughs> So it's insensitive to commuters, uh, contributors' motivations and the community values. For example, a quality control system, a tool which automatically deleted low quality content harmed the motivations of contributors, particularly no, those new contributors who are still learning how to participate. A lot of newcomers actually, as a result, left the Wikipedia community when the edits were rudely reverted by the AI tool. Uh, which harmed the overall growth of the Wikipedia community. What makes designing intelligent tools for Wikipedia even more challenging is the tension between the Wikipedia community and the researcher community. And the uh, research that perform offline analysis of the articles and editor, uh, like editor action is typically non-controversial. However, the community tends to react really strongly to studies that involve intervention studies that affect Wikipedia's natural state. So an experiment conducted by researchers from MIT and the University of Pittsburgh in 2017 actually received a strong pushback from the community and led to the blocking of the, of the research accounts, months of heated discussion in the Wikipedia community, and also the creation of the new Wikipedia policy called Wikipedia is not a laboratory. 
So the, here is one um, like a uh, comment made by a Wikipedia editor who just uh, uh, which just uh, precisely describe what the Wikipedia community wants. And this is actually a comment on another controversial research proposal that was eventually withdrawn due to the strong pushback from the community. So this editor said if the proposal was an earnest effort to improve Wikipedia, the researchers would have worked with the community to for, uh, from the start to design a study that was consistent with our needs and values. So the Wikipedia community really wants something that will be consistent with their needs and values. But when we think through satisfying community needs and values, we identify a bit, uh, like uh, um, some additional challenges. A recruitment system that will operate in Wikipedia involves at least three different stakeholder groups. Those newcomers to Wiki project, the current project members, and the Wikipedia community as a whole. So these uh, stakeholder groups actually have very different needs and values. These needs, uh, so for example, these newcomers value mentorship, uh, mutual interest, current project members, they value productivity and control, and the Wikipedia as a whole, they value the member retention and the long-term growth of the community. And these needs and values are not necessarily aligned with each other. So in this project, we we'll want to answer this question. How can we design intelligent systems that are aligned with multiple stakeholders' needs and values, and how we uh, how we can navigate these different values and needs, especially when there as there are tensions between different values and needs. So uh, here is a traditional ag uh, approach to design algorithm, and uh, or like well, algorithm uh, by the way is an essential component of any intelligent system. The traditional approach of designing this algorithm is not capable of dealing with complicated situation because it is just usually we just precisely define the input, output, and the desired property of the system, then abstracting away this messy reality, social context, and the complex human needs and values surrounding the system. So this method is useful for uh, achieving specific goal and meeting performance metrics, but it's incapable of capturing this wide range of factors that might be involved in the complex uh, system design. So our approach is that we're trying to integrate these complicated social contacts and human values and needs into the abstract the process of creating an algorithm. The key to this solution is a shift away from a solution-oriented approach to a process-oriented one, the one that we a lot of HCR researchers are familiar with. So in this paper we published in uh, CSCW 2018, we propose a four-step approach to consider and integrate the stakeholder values in the design of the recruitment algorithm. The first step is to understand the stakeholder value. The second step is to design initial algorithm based on the understanding of these stakeholder values. The third step is to pilot test the algorithm and deploy it and test it with the stakeholders. And the final step is to reevaluate and to continue to iter iterate and refine the algorithm. I will walk, uh, walk you through these steps. So the first step, understand stakeholder value. As I mentioned earlier, we have already identified three uh, stakeholder groups in this problem. And they are newcomers, they are current project members, and Wikipedia as a whole. And here we define values bro uh, broadly as what a person or group of people consider important in life and not limited to moral values. And sometimes we use like motivations and needs interchangeably. And here we want to use this stakeholders value to guide the creation of the algorithm. And when we create an algorithm, we should not only consider the algorithmic um, approach, in this case will be like how to determine the fit. And we argue that the algorithm cannot be isolated from the data that fuels the AI algorithm and the way the algorithm output is presented. 
So when we think about algorithm design, we will consider like V3, uh, like the, from the data preparation to algorithmic approach to the, uh, uh, until the output presentation. And here is data preparations. Um, uh, it means that how we prepare the data for the algorithm. It's important to consider, the, for example, the inclusion criteria. In this case, the decision is critical because it defines whom the recruitment tool will target. It's also important to consider how to present the algorithm output, that is to whom we should communicate the algorithm output and the user interface for presenting these algorithmic results. So uh, we conduct a literature review and the survey to identify the stakeholders value and how the major choices in data preparation, algorithmic approaches and output presentation will benefit or harm stakeholder va value. Here is a summary of the finding. Uh, I know there are a lot of information on the slides. I don't expect you all to read all of it. This is next few slides, I will go through how we use these findings to guide the creation of the initial algorithm. So the second step, design initial algorithm. So the, um, so the first thing we can think about is uh, the data preparation. Regarding the question of who to include um, in the data preparation, and uh, because these um, like newcomers to Wiki project, they still vary a lot in terms of the experience on Wikipedia. There are two potential options um, like whether we want to target more experienced editors or targeting really brand new editors. And based on our uh, like uh, first step results, we found that these stakeholders disagree on whether the algorithm should target brand new editors or, or they should target like, uh, um, like or only the experienced editors. So we found that the current Wiki project members and they are not uh, like, like productivity of the wiki project. However, for Wikipedia as a whole, and they are really concerned about the low retention of the new editors, which has resulted in an overall decline in the active editor base. As a result, they really want this recruitment like algorithm to target these brand new editors. So we really see these tensions between different stakeholder groups. To address this tension, we implemented multiple designs just to uh, handle in these variants uh, preferences among the stakeholder groups. Specifically, we included both a brand new and experienced editor. We made it possible to evaluate and rank these two types of editors separately so that the uh, experienced editors do not overshadow the inexperienced one. And next question is how we can like design the algorithmic uh, approaches to align with different stakeholders values. Here we want to, uh, the, uh, the central question is how we can design the algorithm to determine the fit. And informed by our prior work on predicting newcomer like posting joining performance, and we identify uh, two ways to determine the fit, which is the interest-based and the relationship-based approach. So just to quickly remind people, the interest-based approach is just to emphasize the interest alignment between the newcomer and the project, while the relationship-based approach focusing on the personal connections of the new uh, the newcomers have already built with the current member of the project. However, based on our first step, like a kind of finding, we also find that stakeholder groups, like the stakeholders disagree. They disagree particularly on the, using the relationship-based approach. Some current project members tend to believe that the relationship-based approach does not necessarily indicate like the best fit and worry that these newcomers recruitment, uh, recruited through the relationship-based fit might not be uh, as productive as they expect. While these newcomers feel like they, they told that they, are, they feel much more comfortable if they can join a group where they, they have already formed some connections with one or more of the members. And to balance these different preferences, we actually implemented both interest-based uh, approaches, a matching algorithm and the relationship-based matching algorithm. 
So we actually created four different algorithms, two are like uh, interest-based and two uh, relationship-based. The first interest-based algorithm is a rule-based algorithm. We just computed the match of an editor to a wiki project by counting the number of recent edits by that editor to the articles within the scope, uh, like within the scope of the project. And the second interest-based algorithm is the category-based algorithm. We computed the similarity score between the editor, the editing history, and the topics of the project. We also created two relationship-based algorithms. The first relationship-based algorithm is a bound-based algorithm. We rank the editors by the strength of the social connections the editor had to the current members of each project. We also created a co-editor-based algorithm, which computed similarity of the edit history to the edit history of the current members of wiki project. So uh, there are some like technical, I'm not going to talk a lot about the technical details of these algorithms. If you are interested, you can refer to our paper. And the next question is how we communicate this algorithm output. Again, we have two options. We can either directly invite the newcomers who, uh, whom like our algorithms think are actually suitable members to the project, or we can communicate with the current members first and allow them to recruit uh, the new members. And based on our findings, and we found that like a current project member, they just strongly objected to the idea of directly inviting newcomers. And they told us that they wanted to be in the loop and to maintain control of inviting newcomers. And therefore, instead of directly inviting potential members, we create a user interface for presenting the recommended, recommended new editors to the current project members. And then we present the top recommendations for all the four algorithms separating the experienced editor and the brand new editor. So here is the interface we designed. This interface was implemented as an interactive element within a wiki project, a Wikipedia page. Uh, it includes the basic information about each candidate. We also provide very uh, short explanation for each recommendation. We also include a link for the current members to click so that they can uh, invite the newcomers. And we also include a short survey at the end to ask the current members to rate the suitability of the recommended editors and give overall feedback. So the next step is that we engage and work closer with the stakeholders to deploy our algorithmic tool. Uh, we work with Wikimedia Foundation and with Wikiproject organizers to uh, deploy the recruitment system. Over a six months period, we evaluated over 16,000 editors and delivered four distinct batches of 385 recru uh, recommendations to 18 wiki projects. And now I'm going to show some of our evaluation results. So usually the evaluation of the algorithm is primarily focusing on the accuracy. However, accuracy is just the one step uh, on the path to where we really want to go. So it's certainly not the end goal. To fully uh, understand the effectiveness of the recruitment algorithm, we evaluate not solely based on the accuracy, but also the stakeholder acceptance, that like a subjective like a feedback, and also the actual impact in the field. We did the sort of evaluation on all the three aspects. So first about the algorithm accuracy, and we uh, look at both, uh, two different accuracy measures. The first one is the current project member's rating on how good the they think the recommendations are. And the second accuracy measure is the invitation rate, which is whether the wiki project members actually invite the recommended editor, which is analogous to the click-through rate. And we found that the rule-based algorithm was rated higher and resulting more invitations compared to the uh, three other type of algorithms. So overall, the accuracy are uh, reasonable. We also compared the rating and the invitation rate across experienced editor and the brand new editors. What we found is that the average rating and the invitation rate were not that different between these two types of uh, editors and suggesting that the algorithmic tool is actually not disadvantaging any brand new editors. And next thing is that we evaluate the stakeholder acceptance. Um, we interviewed both the current project member and the newcomers who were invited to the project. 
And the feedback we got from the interview part, uh, participants were really positive. They really gave us confidence that our system were acceptable to the community. So this is one of my favorite quotes from current project member. They said, uh, this, uh, as I said, this puts some signs behind the recommendation and will be a great supplement to the current process. This actually indicates that our tool can be like well embedded into the current recruitment process for a lot of Wookiee projects. And this is a message from a new member who were invited to join a project. And the new member said, thank you for reaching out to me. And thank you really for informing me about the Wiki Project Africa. I really appreciate it. We're also trying to get some feedback from the general Wikipedia community. So we create a signpost, which is Wikipedia internal block to describe our project. And this is a screenshot of some of the comments on the signpost. I'm not going to read every uh, single comment. Overall, the community re reacted positively. Uh, our collaborator, Aaron Hafiker, actually told us that he really sees such a unanimous, like positive uh, responses um, because usually these Wikipedians just disagree on everything. And here is another interesting note. And this is a screenshot of some recent discussion around the Wikipedia policy on uh, Wikipedia is not a lab. So first the one editor left some very strong note on like editors uh, saying that our uh, editors who are using Wikipedia in any way for experimentation may be banned. And the rationale is that the purpose of Wikipedia is to summarize existing knowledge, not to trying to generate new knowledge. Uh, then we see another editor replied. This editor said there are a number of experiments done in good faith to increase the quality of the project or the experience of editors, the editor retention, etc. And one example of a retention, a recent one is Bobo Zero Threads Wiki Project Editor Recommendation. So Bobo Zero Threads is my student's account. So I'm happy to see that our project seems to have a, a, a little bit positive influence on improving the tense relationship between the Wikipedia community and the researcher community. Uh, we also conducted a mixed method evaluation on the impact of the actress tool on the stakeholder. In the interest of time, I'm not going to discuss the detail as here is just, just some summary. Our algorithm can identify newcomers who are more suitable and the current members did additional investigation and select the most promising newcomers among the recommended ones. And uh, we also found the current members provided additional help and the mentorship to the invited newcomers which led to more contributions. So overall, our evaluation of the tools show that like our, our, uh, our tools seems to be effective and they are like, a, uh, we are really showing that they perform uh, quite well across these three aspects. So here is a summary of the contribution of this work. And we show that we can generate some knowledge of the stakeholder value regarding intelligent recruitment system in Wikipedia. We created four different algorithms for identifying suitable newcomers. We designed and deployed a working intelligent recruitment system in the field. And we also demonstrate the potential of a general design process for incorporating stakeholders needs and values into the creation of the algorithm. So next, I will uh, briefly talk about some of our ongoing projects that I'm really excited about. So uh, a lot of these online platforms increasingly rely on AI to manage their content, the workforce, and other activities. For example, Facebook algorithm manipulates all of the posts users see on the news feed. Social media sites like Twitter uh, like you, uh, use algorithm to automatically identify and send the unwanted content. Like gig economy platforms like Uber, Lyft, and TaskRabbit rely on intelligent systems to automatically optimize and assign tasks to workers. And this is probably a trend for our society. A lot of researchers envision that in future human activities will be managed and organized by algorithm, intelligent assistant and bots. Therefore, it's really uh, important and timely to study these AI-based management system on online platform because they might provide an important insight and future lens for, uh, a lens for our future. 
So uh, I will briefly discuss two pieces of ongoing project focusing on like AI-based management on different online platforms. One is like our work on improving the machine learning based work evaluation on Wikipedia. And second one is empowering and enhancing Git workers through building intelligent tools. So the first one about the work evaluation in Wikipedia, on the English version of Wikipedia alone, they receive about 160,000 new edits every day, which immediately go live. And the Wikipedia has built a machine learning based evaluation system to assess the quality of the edits. The system includes ORIS, which is a prediction model that automatically assess the quality of the edit and a set of semi-automated editing tools and automated agents that rely on the outputs of the ORIS system. And together they will make actions like a revert or warn the editor or reward the editors. So the challenges of building this machine learning based evaluation system is that first, they work, uh, it works in diverse world contexts and have multiple stakeholders like involved in each uh, context. And also uh, based on some prelim uh, preliminary work, we found that there are some tensions between different stakeholder goals. For example, the RS team told us that struggling between the quality control and the member retention, specifically prioritizing efficiency in deleting low quality content incurs the risk of undermining the motivation of contributors, especially those ones who are still learning how to contribute. And there is second trade-off is between the uh, fairness and the accuracy. So uh, the team has already received the report that their model is biased against anonymous editors. However, in improving fairness, for example, equalizing false positive rate or false negative rates between the different groups, the overall accuracy might decrease. So we need to balance the trade-off between fairness and accuracy. So in this project, and we are trying to answer the question, how can we handle the inherent trade-offs between different stakeholder goals in a machine learning based content moderator, uh, like a work evaluation uh, system. So we follow these steps. So we're first trying to understand the stakeholder goals, and then we can design and evaluate novel techniques to capture, explain, and negotiate. Sorry that it has some auto, uh, automatic uh, transition. So we start with understanding the uh, Wikipedia stakeholders values by like uh, interviewing different stakeholder groups in Wikipedia. We identify these five uh, like uh, important values for the communities and also discuss the potential tensions between these values. And next, we also design an interactive visualization system to communicate the trade-off between important goals and values. And, the more, uh, and uh, sh this like visualization system can be used to educate the developers of the AI tools and also the Wikipedia community as a whole. We also designed the value cards, which is an educational toolkit for educating future AI developers to understand the inherent trade-offs uh, among different machine learning models and their social impacts on stakeholders beyond Wikipedia. So, so this is uh, like generic tools can be used in the classroom to teach the students and uh, to understand the social uh, impact and to understand the trade-off. And this toolkit also enables the negotiations through deliberation. In this a uh, paper we recently submitted to FACT 2021, we present an early use of our approach in a college level computer science course. So uh, that was our uh, first uh, project about improving the machine learning based work value system on Wikipedia. And next I will briefly talk about our ongoing project of empowering and enhancing gig workers through building intelligent tools. Um, as we know, uh, like the pandemic really has been uh, has a really big impact on our life. And actually, in a recent report uh, conducted by Upwork, they found that the pandemic could be turning gig economy white collar. They found that 24% more people made a recent decision to enter the gig economy than most years on record. And a lot of them are actually have a high skill, uh, like uh, for example, they are programmers or like uh, have uh, like uh, at least a bachelor degrees. 
And however, on, uh, in, uh, uh, although on one hand we notice this growth of gig economy, uh, also there are a lot of like tensions on or, or like uh, controversies on these gig economy platforms. For example, the power asymmetry on this gig economy platform might harm the well-being of the workers. And we know that there is a recent like a campaign trying to keep the uh, Uber and Lyft drivers as contractors in California. This is called the Proposition 22. Actually recently been proved. So uh, in this project, we're trying to see how we can empower and enhance the gig workers by building a community-centered gig economy. Specifically, we're trying to see how can we can develop the data-driven and the human-centered decision assistant environment to really help the gig workers make up smart decisions in navigating and selecting gigs. And we're also trying to see how we can sorry, uh, provide uh, like tools for policymakers so that they can balance uh, like different uh, diverse set of objectives and constraints. So this is a collaboration project among four different institutions. I really want to thank Karen and Metro 21 for their support. And this is a newly funded project and we don't have a lot of results yet, but hopefully by the same time, maybe next year or in two years, we will know more and have more results to share. So that's some of our uh, ongoing work. And for the uh, now, I'm going to describe some big picture. As Google's AI team states, a, uh, artificial intelligence can provide new ways of approaching problems and meaningfully improve people's lives. However, the challenge is how to ensure that the AI technologies once introduced into the complicated social context can achieve the desired outcome. So at the high level, the goal of my research team is trying to answer this question. How to integrate the understanding of the social context in which AI is embedded and the needs, values, concerns, and goals of the people in the context into the development of AI technologies with the broader goals of improving people's lives and accomplishing collective goals. Uh, so that's the, um, uh, the, the presentation I've prepared. Thank you so much for listening to the talk and I'm happy to answer your questions. Great, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Ai. I learned so much, even though we're working on the Metro 21 project, uh, yeah, we're working collaboratively, but I love, um, the, I guess this underlying issue of trust, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important right. thing that. So can you just talk a little bit about that trust that underlines a lot of this. Thank you. Yes, yes, of course. So I think that uh, that's really trust of these AI system is really a big issue as we see like in online community like Wikipedia, but also in offline communities like uh, we, uh, we have been working with Allegheny County on these child maltreatment screening tools. We do notice that there are a lot of people they do not trust the tool AI system and more broadly even uh, have some like this trust for the whole, uh, it's not just the distrust of this kind of AI technology, but also distrust the system as a whole. So how we can uh, improve, uh, build uh, like trust, I think it involves like things like really integrating these people, stakeholders' concerns. In the early stage of designing the system, uh, involves a lot of understanding people's concern, incorporating people's concerns, and trying to make the uh, like AI system transparent, showing that how the system really respect the people's values and uh, piloting uh, like testing the system with the stakeholder continuously like evaluating the system allow people to monitor and auditing the system all of these can really help improve people's trust of the uh, AI tools and the system as a whole. And another thing is sometimes uh, we also find that people's like uh, uh, distrust might also bring in some positive impact uh, or consequences, especially if the AI are actually making errors. So we were always saying that we don't want to like uh, have people to blindly trust AI tools, the technologies, but help people to better calibrate their trust. So they should trust the system when, or, or the tools when they are making good decisions, but you might don't want to trust them when they are making like a bad decisions. 
And that's another interesting topic we are currently exploring how to uh, help people calibrate their trust. That is that is fantastic, and I think also uh, you know the reason we see it as smart cities is as you know you, you worked in Wikipedia, which is like a virtual smart community, yeah. and yeah, now you're exactly. looking at the gig economy, and you know right. the issue of stakeholders and trust is so critical, and like you said, it's during the design, the deployment, and the evaluation. It's all exactly. Of that. Um, mm -hmm. We have a great question here from Patrick. I don't know if you can. See it, but Let I'll, me see if I yeah, can. so I'll read it. Or Patrick, do you want to, feel free to, if you want to unmute Patrick, go ahead. Okay, If great. I can figure this out. Um, let me see, if you can see it on there, yeah. I, I've just um, kind of been working with some of these communities and um, I used to uh, manage a volunteer program in Peru. And there since, tends to be this pattern where when you make, um, when you rely on volunteers or these kind of intrinsic sources of motivation, you tend to kind of exclude certain populations that don't have a lot of free time and that luxury, mm -hmm. you know, doing that sort of thing. So, um, you know, there are some kind of obvious potential consequences to that in terms of lack of representation of these voices in a, you know, particularly in the context of Wikipedia. Um, so I'm just curious if you've, um, you know, what other kinds of consequences you see to this and if there's any kind of workaround that you've found in kind of your surveying of these different types of projects. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good uh, observation and a very good point. So we also find uh, on Wikipedia because they heavily rely on the volunteers. So that's a very skewed population and they have some shared like characteristics. So one thing is like they are like a, it's interestingly, uh, like uh, also because the whole design of the Wikipedia has a certain characteristic as a result, they see, uh, for example, majority of the editors are a young male and uh, they are like a uh, majority of them are white and they also are like tend to be like uh, maybe computer geeks. <laughs> so that's, uh, um, so we are, uh, so these kind of like a lack of representation of this population do cause a lot of like a downstreaming like consequences. Actually Wikipedia content, they found that they really lack the diversity and in terms of, for example, they, they have much more content in male interested content like uh, history. If you look at the military history, then the, a lot of these articles have very, very, a lot of content. But even for other uh, like uh, important topics uh, like uh, fashion or other, sometimes people characterize the uh, female interested content, they see much fewer content and they are less developed. And also the female biographies are less represented in the Wikipedia content. So we are trying to do a lot, trying to also trying to improve the diversity uh, in both the editor base and also in the content uh, level. So one thing uh, like uh, the uh, things we do is trying to, uh, uh, I'm not working particularly on this project, but there are some other researchers, also researchers from Carnegie Mellon, trying to integrate the Wikipedia writing in the class teaching. For example, you can have college students or high school students, and once they are like a learning a topic, Topic and maybe as a final project, then they can learn, uh, they can actually write a Wikipedia article or improve Wikipedia articles and then like uh, submit it to uh, Wikipedia. But then there will be a lot of questions like, oh, we want to certainly want to maintain the quality of the article, make sure that the students' contributions already have a good quality and they are well uh, reference the right uh, kind of citations and they should also align with the Wikipedia's policies. So there is a whole actually Wikipedia education program and trying to uh, integrate the Wikipedia writing with some of the other uh, external resources, especially uh, integrated with the classroom teaching and, and have uh, multiple objectives that is trying to improve the diversity of the content and also hopefully the exercise itself will be a good uh, educational activities to help students learn the uh, content and topic. So, um, and we are also trying to do some other stuff trying to uh, also ca uh, 
capture the uh, like the for example the gender bias on the Wikipedia content and to measure the uh, bias and see how we can design or uh, tools or like a mechanism to improve or re uh, improve, improve the diversity of the content especially like reduce the gender inequality gender bias uh, on the content that's great yeah, thank you Thanks, Patrick. Um, any more questions from the audience? Feel free to jump in. Uh, I think th the question that Patrick also was talking about this issue and is extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. And it's very rare to see somebody with intrinsic motivation. It's lovely and it's great. But I, you know, as a mother to two teenage daughters, I'll tell you, <laughs> extrinsic motivation is really important. And so I'm curious, um, how that, do you think that if you build in more stakeholder feedback mm -hmm. and you can capture more of that and motivate people to participate mm -hmm. in a shared economy and feel, you know, that it's equitable and they can trust it? I, that, I think that was a really, for me, Patrick, that was a really good observation, especially since I, I personally am struggling with that myself. Yeah, definitely. So I, I think the extrinsic motivation, intrinsic motivation is very, very important. So we will also seeing that or well, once we want to like engage stakeholder for example in the design of the process so we are currently heavily like relying on the intrinsic motivation so uh, as patrick mentioned uh, and also we have been discussing like a uh, uh, rely on intrinsic motivations might actually lead to a certain uh, kind of outcome i think it's a good uh, thing to like uh, uh, explore continue to explore what are uh, what are the the incentive maybe we should design that to broaden the participation of the stakeholders uh, to encourage them in the design of the uh, uh, both the system uh, and also uh, encourage them in the, in the participation of the whole process and I think it's a uh, like ongoing and it's an open question it's a really good question. Yeah that's great. Um, any more questions from the audience? Don't be shy. I do have another question. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> yeah, feel, feel free to, to keep it as brief as you want to. But um, yeah, I, I've just been looking at some other, so I, I work with some other communities who, who conceive of themselves as working in this kind of peer production space. And we're uh, currently um, looking at kind of trying to build a database that kind of collects examples of projects and organizations that are working in this space. Um, but the challenge that we're coming across is just um, in coming up with kind of a clear definition of, um, you know, what entities, what organizations belong within those boundaries. Um, and I'm just kind of curious because you work in lots of different areas. It looks like kind of the uh, citizen science um, and the, the kind of gig work thing. So I'm looking, I'm just wondering if you're borrowing from some particular taxonomy when you uh, draw those boundaries um, and if you could maybe refer me to specific uh, you know frameworks or models that that have helped kind of guide your understanding of that space yeah uh, I would say that like uh, um, yeah, there, there is always not a very clear boundary <laughs> for these kind of uh, maybe commu online communities or platforms so uh, on top of my head, so we, 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 for example, when we are trying to write this review paper for sharing economy, we also encounter these similar things. Uh, what is the definition for sharing economy? Uh, who should be counted? Who which should, should not be counted? So we use this working definition for sharing economy, which is the platform that facilitates like uh, the sharing of underutilized assets and services. So that's the definition we use for the sharing economy, I believe. And then for the peer production, and again, it's a very, very uh, like a, a, a blurry kind of definition or boundary there. So we just uh, like, uh, we will like usually in the paper writing, we're trying to like say more specific 
for example, for if we are talking about Wikipedia, we are just uh, this uh, online like uh, um peer, uh, like uh, uh, open encyclopedia. So we specific we be really specific about what we are talking about. If it's uh, like uh, when we study Stack Overflow, if it's an online QA site, or if it's uh, uh, citizen science, for them uh, that's more specific about having people collectively do some tasks to um uh, of, of, of particular type of task. So. Uh, I guess we tend to have uh, like when we write the specific write about result of specific kind of context, we will use the like the definition, a smaller definition for that particular context or platform. So uh, I um, yeah, uh, let me think. I think uh, in the book, uh, Bob Kraut, uh, who is a faculty at uh, HCRI, and he writes about the, I think he proposed the concept of the online community. So that's something in the concept I also see a lot of people use, also so, so, so a lot of my own work use the uh, online community, so it's a much more broader, so potentially we can uh, actually uh, have all of these, uh, we can say that they are online communities, no matter you are like a peer production, or you are like a social networking and uh, um, maybe sometimes like even gig economy or like a sharing economy, you can say that it's an online community. It's like a group of people gathered together in a virtual space to accomplish uh, like uh, for a shared purpose. So that, that's a definition of online community. So maybe you can look at uh, his book uh, about like evidence-based uh, social design, like uh, um, I think, yeah, what is the full name of the book? Yeah, Building Successful Online Community, Evidence-Based Social Design. So that's the name of the book. Thank you, you said that, sorry, the name was Bob. Yeah, so uh, I just put it uh, in the chat, so. Uh, it's Bob uh, Robot Crowd. Oh, there, okay, yeah, I see it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heidi. This has been a really educational, and um, we're really proud of the work that you're doing. And you're a relatively new uh, member to join the CMU community, so we're you 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 moved here before the pandemic, right? Yes, I'm right here before the pandemic. Uh, yeah, I started in 2019. <laughs> right, okay, good, good, good. Yeah, so I know we had some faculty join this summer. So they, they <laughs> so luckily you had a little taste of what Carnegie Mellon community is like before yeah, we all went to lunch. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I got uh, like six months. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> a little tease. Well, yeah. good. We're, we're proud to have you as part of the Metro 21 community and your work is super important. And I'm really grateful to the audience and Patrick for your great questions. And I'm glad it has applicability to you. Um, I don't think we have any more questions. So I'm gonna leave the last, uh, I'm gonna um, end this session, but thank you so much. We're gonna post your presentation online and we'll have a link and um, yeah, subscribe to our newsletter, go onto our website and get more information so you can make sure you're aware of conferences. I mean, uh, <laughs> webinars like the one we're holding today, everything virtual. <laughs> All yes. right, thanks, Heidi. Thank you. All right, take bye care. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.